don't think I, I don't think I got the base to that. <laughs> I had a feeling I was a few notes one way or another. Um, uh, that, that's probably going to occur more and more as I as I age. <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't know what I can do. I, we're stuck. <laughs> you know, my base is going away. Um, <laughs> the whole point of this stuff <laughs> that I'm preaching here is not to get rid of the law. We, I don't want to get rid of the law. You know, but we have to change our relationship to the law. That's the point of all of this. Now, I have another uh, Dean Light says too bad he's not here. But here's another, uh, I have my, my, uh, another example, another illustration. So uh, I had, had asked Tatum, she, she drew this man. <laughs> and I'm sure she did better than I could. But anyway, here we are. All right. And the, uh, the other thing I didn't have her draw was uh, a field. We'll, we'll put that up there too. Just the, the same field we talked about last time. It's a... Uh, a field, that's all. Just it's got wheat in it. Yeah, okay. And the same and you see a, I think there's an appropriate scripture up there on the screen now. And so it kind of represents the law. Uh, the problems with the law <clears throat> as far as the old man of sin is concerned. All right, so let me get this out of the way. Anyway, uh, we touched on the difference between the new creature and the old man. All right. Uh, the old man of sin, see the, the, uh, one of the points was that the law can't be used for uh, 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 to obtain righteousness. We can't justify ourselves with the law. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, and the reason is because the natural man, as we saw, he's always going to try to get around the precepts. You know, God says, uh, you know, don't, don't harvest your wheat, I'll leave some wheat, leave something for the poor people in the corner. And of course, depending on the natural man, how greedy, you know, he might leave, you know, three stocks, might leave, you know, a couple of square feet, might even leave a big area. But in either case, what he's going to be thinking is, I've earned my righteousness by doing the law. You know, <laughs> this little guy right here, I did the law, I'm righteous. You know, this, you know, three stocks. And uh, the Jews did this all the time uh, during the time of Christ. While he was on the earth, they were always doing that. <clears throat> you know, that, that was the way they approach the law, but that's the, the natural man, the old man. And so anyway, uh, and so what happens is that the natural man ends up bargaining with God for righteousness. You know, so much obedience for so much righteousness until you get enough in your bank account, until you're now justified, you have a right, you have earned by obedience your right to enter into heaven. This is the basis of every single religion in the world. We're not a religion. Okay. <clears throat> you got to, if you're going gonna to earn nirvana, or you're going to earn your, how many, how many virgins do you get if you're Muslim? I don't know, whatever stack they are, <laughs> you know, whatever, I don't know, you know, whatever it is, you got to earn it though. Same thing for if you're Mormon. You're going to have to earn it. You know, you're going to earn your godhood and then you get your own planet and whatever. Okay. So anyway, uh, now I don't know how Abraham's relationship worked with God. This thing's right. Oh, I can't look at you, Tony, very good. But anyway, uh, I don't know how it works. I, you know, I mean, Abraham was obviously justified. Uh, we know that. Uh, God said that he counted or he imputed or he uh, calculated Abraham's faith as righteousness. And so, and the reason for, was, the stated reason was, because Abraham believed in God, then God counted it to him for righteousness. So as far as God was concerned, Abraham was a righteous man. Now we know Abraham sinned, but it didn't matter, because God counted his faith as righteousness. Okay, and so if you're righteous, you're worthy of eternal life. See, and that's outside any requirements of the law. The law didn't even exist at the time. There wasn't a law. Okay. Now, for us Christians, see, some things are the same as they are, um, as it was with Abraham in our relationship with God. And some things these days are vastly different. Okay, so Abraham, he didn't work, believed on him, so he was justified. See, but for a Christian, our, our, uh, that justification, that faith in, in God, faith in Christ that leads to our justification... The, 
that melds instantly into justification, that's just the beginning. You know, that's, you know Abraham, he went ahead and, and uh, you know, lived out his life and, and whatever. But there was never any extra stuff, if you will, that was given to Abraham. It doesn't mention anything like that. But look what happened with a Christian, though. It's the beginning of a package deal. It's, it, 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 there's a, the adoption. They were talking about Abraham being adopted and being uh, recreated, a new man. Uh, and, and, and being made the living temple of the Holy Spirit. Never talked about that in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, becoming part of the bride of Christ, eternal life, all that, you know, Abraham got eternal life, but the rest of this stuff wasn't mentioned, you know. See, this is a huge package deal that we get. It is different. It's a whole different thing than Abraham experienced. Abraham received his justification by faith, see, but... For us, justification is the starting point, just the beginning. You know, there's other other things that are hugely important, and so we still sin. See, and there's a, a and there's a reason for that. And of course, you know, this is where this this you know this man illustration, this illustration of a guy, uh, comes in. You remember when when uh, the last election, the votes were all getting counted up, and and. Uh, and, and, and the whole nation suddenly woke up to the fact that this, that we suddenly we had this kind of a strange looking real estate mogul turned TV host guy for a president. What? What was that? And remember the riots, no, you know, screaming, like that. you remember all that, you know? <laughs> That's, you know that was you know the divide is so sharp it's not not just a small divide this is huge people who voted one way were really intense about it people who didn't get their way were even more intense about it hey you know we uh, it, it's been remarked a lot of times not just one not it's not me saying this but we're two different nations in this country we're two nations here. You know, California even talked about succeeding. We're leaving. This is it. We're taking our apples and we're, you know, balls, whatever. We're getting out of town. That's it. We've had it with you guys. You know, we're no longer a part of Idaho. <laughs> yeah, like that. Okay, well, anyway, President Obama said the same thing. He said that people who voted for Trump, you guys live in a different world than we do. That's what he said. And he was right. Hey, you know, it's uh, such different outlooks on life that constitutes different worlds. Really, we're no longer one people in this nation. We are divided right smack dab down the middle. And it's not just this little line you can easy to step across. It is huge. If you, uh, if you, if you're, you know, say in the cat, you know, in a college or someplace where, where the majority of people were really Hillary supporters and you try to, you know, and if you change your mind and decide to go against that, man, you get persecuted. This isn't, this is intense. It's not, not just, you know, not just a, a difference of opinion. It is cause for anger and feeling betrayed and like that. You know, this is very serious. I mean, you know, you, I saw one guy, you know, this, he was trying to, you know, he was demonstrating on one side and somebody else was demonstrating on the other side. And the guy on the other side, he had a, a bicycle lock on a chain. He come up there and smacked the guy in the head, you know? <laughs> yeah, he did. Boom. You know, it was a pretty quick movement too. He just, come on, you can see his face too. Somebody got a video camera of it and he, you know, and he, I don't know, he prosecuted some way or other, but not much, but you know, bam, that was, that was, that's what's out there. You know, that's what's out there. We are divided. So anyway, so anyway, so uh, it, it, now what happens is the problem for us is that we're divided too. We're, you know, we have two competing nations inwardly who are vying, who are trying to occupy the same piece of real estate right here. That's us. You know, and on one side, you have the new creation. On the other side, you have the old man. And we're in conflict, right? 
Okay, and so uh, you know it, it's it's just exactly the same way as we see in our own nation. You see the intensity of the conflict outside. Same things going on inside of us. Okay, and so uh, it's an it's perfect illustration of what uh, Christians experience. What we see on the outside. It's a good illustration of what we're experiencing on the inside. So the problem is, see, the old man, he still exists here. And, and so this body, one body, is trying to house two completely opposite beings, two completely opposite nations inside one piece of real estate. And so the conflict, it's exactly the same. It's the same, the same happens inside of us for the same reason that the conflict happens in our nation, too. And so, for, and so for that reason, see, Christians uh, sometimes, in fact, most of the time, what happens is the Christians, uh, they try to maintain a relationship with the law. This satisfies both sides, you know, but you really can't do that, okay? Uh, we, we can't, see, because you have these two nations, they're trying to control the real estate. They're at odds. They're diametrically opposed. Look, here's a for instance. Now... <sighs> Uh, as we get older, we, we view, for instance, a very, you know, divisive, divisive subject is abortion. All right. And so for the new man, abortion is murder. I, you know, it's a, it's a horror. You know, when you, you know, partial birth abortions and like that, that's, that's absolutely, you know, that's horrendous. But for the old man of sin, what you have, you know, out there now, you have people Abortion is almost a, a, a religious sacrament you know, to evolution. That is a, a sacrament to death. It's a religious experience for a lot of people on the other side. See, it's the occasion for joy and abortion is the case for celebration. You know, it can't get any more opposite than that. Right? And so it would be inevitable then that such opposites would also approach the law of God in opposite ways. <laughs> Naturally, they're going to. They're opposites. We are opposites. But you see, the Christians, we, we, try to, we try to do both. We try to satisfy both with respect to the law. But the nations that we are, the inward men that we are, can't coexist without conflict. And so Christians, we experience the conflict that you'd expect. And that's the way it is. We are conflicted with each other, with ourselves. So we try to relate to God as our Father. Oh, you know, our Lord, our Father, our very kind, good, dependable Father. And yet at the same time, we continue to try to purchase the favor by doing the law of our kind, dependable Father, who maybe is not that dependable because otherwise we wouldn't be trying to purchase his favor, right? So, you know, that makes no sense, but we do that. All right. So anyway, uh, no one should have to purchase acceptance uh, uh, from his dad. You know, a father's acceptance is the birthright of the child. You get born into the family, then it's just incumbent upon the dad to accept the child. Of course he's going to do that. He better do that, you know, and he does. Uh, at least our father does. And so it's the stranger, see, the stranger who tries to gain admittance into the family by barter. Uh, you know, he tries to get in by offering something. And the reason he does that is because he has no right of inheritance. It's natural for him to do that. He has to. He's, he's, not, an, he's not an inheritor. He's not born into the family. See, and so uh, he has no inherit right to the house. And so, he, he, and so what happens is, because the guy... You know, here's our, 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 you know, our new man on one side. He finds himself, unfortunately, acting as if he actually has no right to the house. He has no right to be there. A lot of Christians act that way, you know, because you're trying to do both and you can't. So, so it's tragic, you know, a child who has a right to, by birth, he's, he's got the right to live in the house with his parents. He still tries to purchase their favor by acts of obedience. And of course, if your kid tried to do that, immediately, go, oh, what, what are you talking about? We're not kicking you out no matter what. Yeah, no, I didn't mean you could write on the walls. No, you know, that's, but I'm still not going to kick you out even if you do. You know, you see what I'm saying? You know, what are you doing trying to buy my affection? That makes no, you know, you're my kid. Of course, you know, love you and all that. 
Oops, yeah, I get mad. <laughs> you know, that's true too, right? Okay, so anyway, he's born into the family. We're born into the family, see? And so not all Christians live in that confidence. And uh, many of us spend a lot of our time trying to buy obedience, buy with obedience, that which is already ours by birthright. And I mean, it's our birthright. Look, John 1.12 on the screen there. It's a right. And nevertheless, see, with the passage of time, the gaining of experience, you know, uh, and it, despite all the problems, the new nation, the new creature is ascending in power and glory. This is pretty much inevitable. And so really, we start to take over more and more of the real estate and very gradually, you know, move it over. We're taking, moving in and the old man of sin's moving out. Goodbye, buddy. You know, so, and we're going this way. We're taking it. This is it. But it's a process. It's slow. Oh, it can be slow. So anyway, uh, uh, so the new creature is ascending in power and in glory and in Christ's likeness. Uh, and the old man of uh, the old nation is, is losing his power. Okay. And he's, you know, he, it descends into death. You know, he knows too that this body that, that this old man is occupying is going to die or be translated. It's going to die. And that old nation, that old man is going to die with it. New man won't die. Won't die. Okay, so anyway, uh, so I, I just want you to notice when this happens in, in your own hearts, in your own minds, I guess, that uh, I'm hoping by pointing all this out that it makes us aware of this conflict. I, you know, that, uh, so that the ascension of the new creature is accelerated. We don't, you know, we don't want to go through 20 years of trying to satisfy both it would you know it'd be better not to go through any years but you know five is better than 20 10 is better than 20 also 19 is better than 20. anyway let the old man pass away let the new creature thrive and grow now rather than later and of course i'm talking to myself too because there's always that tendency to try to buy god's affection now as to the law we're new creatures our relationship with it is a whole new thing different okay but the problem is we're not especially wise new creatures. <laughs> I'm not real smart. You know. We just, uh, you know, we're not. So we puzzle over the law a lot. And so it, see, it, it, since we're not super wise, then God goes ahead and gives us a law. And in the law, he gives us a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, elaborations, a lot of, well, for instance, you know, like this. And for instance, that, see. But these are just elaborations. Can you imagine a law that tries to cover every conceivable circumstance? The United States, in the United States, we have millions of laws. I am confident that each and every one of us unknowingly is breaking one of those laws this moment. You can't own a crab without breaking law. You can't, I mean, it's true. You know, you buy a crab in Safeway and there's some law someplace I've read about where it's illegal to have that crab. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this is the case. You know, that, that's, the, millions of them. God, you know, you can imagine how thick your Bible would be. <laughs> you know, that's, I, you, it's not going to happen, right? So what God does is he gives us generalities. Generality, generality, generalities. Anyway, so, um, yeah, see, we can't do that. I mean, he's not going to do He didn't even try to do that. Yeah, well. Here's the law in general. So uh, what we have then is actually a couple of commands, uh, the two main commands, and then all the, you know, and then some elaborations and examples to go along with them, see? And so uh, now the old man, he thinks that if he just does the examples and the elaborations, he's good enough. <laughs> well, that's nuts. These are just examples. You got to do, but you got to do the intent behind the law that's a different thing altogether so anyway he thinks he's going to buy the favor of god and uh, see but the new man he has acceptance with god already we don't have to worry about that that's not a problem that's not it uh, you know so we view the law then as he views uh, you know the new man as examples of how his dad wants him to act in general in general that is what the father would do have you do depending on the circumstances and we, we wonder, we worry about that a lot. We pray about it. We think about it. Oh, man, because, uh, see, so when the law says, love God, who's your father, 
love your dad with all your heart, mind, and strength. See, that's the general idea. And so, and so where does it start? Well, Jesus said, okay, now you start here. If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Love God, we do what he wants. That's the idea, right? Okay, and so, uh, uh, you know, see, but the new creature, you're not buying God's affection. See, if you love me, keep my commandments. And every time that we fail to keep a commandment, obviously we don't love him enough to keep that one. I, you know, we're not buying anything. Okay, you know, we have that. But what happens is the new man responds to the affection of the father. That's the way it's supposed to work. Okay. Now, <clears throat> can't forget the fact that this nice responding new man is also fighting over territory. That, that's a constant for Christians. Okay. And so the next command says, love your neighbor as yourself. And suddenly things get tricky. Uh, okay. That sounds, that sounds easy. I mean, it's a short sentence. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, what, five or six words. See, and this is why, because it is tricky, that's why we have so many elaborations in the law about this command. See, every one of our neighbors, every one of our neighbors... That guy over there, this guy right there, that guy over there, and the one sitting, standing up here, I'm your neighbor. <laughs> well, the problem is that, that either, uh, you know, we're either, your neighbors are completely the old man of sin, or else your neighbors at best are, are Christians who are in contention with the old man of sin. That's what you have here. You know? that's, so this neighbor is not, you know, he's one of these guys, you know. So anyway, now that's what makes it hard. See, now. So here we go. We got to do this. Same. Father, you know, uh, uh, you know, my neighbor. You, you want me to love my neighbor, right? And he says, "Well, yeah, right. Love your neighbors yourself." You know, but but Father, this guy is a total turkey. I'm just telling you, you can't be serious. <laughs> you know, look, he's a jerk. Come on, <laughs> I just. Oh, yeah. He steals stuff. In fact, you know what? Even worse than that, he steals my stuff. <laughs> you know? Hey, uh, he, he beats his wife and kids. <laughs> he gets drunk. He, he, he spends all his money on drugs. Uh, he didn't wash very much. He stinks and he had bad teeth. <laughs> oh, you know, you, you want me to love a guy like that? <laughs> and, and, and the father says, well, really? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, he didn't have to love you. you know, he could say that. He didn't bring it up immediately, but yeah, he could say that. And, and see, and somewhere in this conversation, this wonderful, affectionate father, uh, uh, you know, we have who's going to give us their eternal life, suddenly he becomes instead God, our Lord God Almighty, who's high and lifted up, and he's pressing his unreasonable demands on us. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing has changed suddenly. Okay. You know who's having that conversation? This guy. He's the old man. He's the guy that's having that conversation. That's, and so when you start thinking like that, you remember who's doing that? That's the old guy. That's the old guy. See? And, and so the old man, you know, the old, he's the one who's doing the protesting. And for sure, the old man is in. He has no intention of going any further farther towards obeying that commandment about loving your neighbors yourself than he absolutely has to. I'll tell you the truth. When it comes to not reaping into the corner of his field, man, he's going to be right there. <laughs> That's it. That's all this guy gets. You know, this particular neighbor, he's going to be lucky to find even two stubbles of wheat when he goes out gleaning. Yeah. I'll tell you that right now. You know, that's the old guy. That's the old guy. When we when we start thinking like that, we're in a struggle. We're struggling with him. See, and our old man, he only leaves two stubbles of wheat so he can feel justified. He's back to buying his affection, buying his right to enter into the house. That's what he's doing there. Nah, that's the old man. See, but God's impatient. You know, he. I mean, he's very patient. God's very patient with us. And so he takes this time, he, he teaches his newly adopted and very conflicted kids. <laughs> we are conflicted, right? He knows that. And so he says things like, well, well, you know, Cliff, he's, he's blind. 
<laughs> the guy's a jerk and now I, he's blind. Hey, so, so you could at least, at the very least, just, just try not to trip him as he walks by. Okay. And so I think there's a, we have that up there? <laughs> Should not trip the blind man. And so Leviticus 19, 14, see? And so, but when God says that, yeah, look, he's talking to a new creature when he says that. Don't trip him. You know what the old guy would do? Not only would he trip him, he'd probably shove him out in the traffic. <laughs> okay, so don't want to do that. Yeah, all right. But the new man, the new man, he's, he's talking to God. He's, I'd never do that. I'm not going to trip the guy. You know, you know that. And then God says, well, could you see to it as much as you can? Could you see to it at least that he doesn't wander out in the traffic? Now, there's nothing in the law about keeping this guy out of the traffic. You know where, you know where this conversation is coming from? It's coming from the Holy Spirit. And who listens to the Holy Spirit? The new guy. The new guy. Yeah. And so he can hear the Holy Spirit. The old guy can't. He says, yeah, keep him out. And the new man says, yeah. You know, father. It's all of a sudden God's father again. You know, the new man talking. He's father now. He's not the lawgiver. You know, and he says, uh, you know, you know, I'd do that to him. I mean, you don't have to tell me not to push him out in the traffic. I won't let him go out in the traffic. And then the spirit says, well, what if he has a flat tire and you got to give him a right to work, a <laughs> ride to work? I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I'd do that for you, Lord. You know, but I want you to know something. He'll probably steal my wallet and laptop. <laughs> okay. Hey, you see, the conversation doesn't have anything at all to do with reaping into the corners of the field. It's not, it hasn't anything to do with the law. It has nothing to do with justification. It has nothing to do with forgiveness of sins. Nothing like that. It has everything to do with what some poor turkey guy needs. That the father knows he needs, and this man knows he needs it too. You know, the good, you know, the, the new creation. It's, it's... You know, the situation is not cut and dried. This guy's a thief. You know, it's, it's beyond the law. It's outside anything the law is able to prescribe an action for. There's no action. You know, no, nothing in the law about keeping him, out, keeping him out of the traffic. Yeah. But it has to do with the love between the father and in this part. You know, the father and the child, you know. And so, and the love of the father for the stranger, you know, the you know, father died for, sent Jesus for this guy too, right? Okay. And so, you know, it's not the law. It's communication between a compassionate father and a son about what to do for his son's rotten neighbor. Okay. See? It's a whole different thing. It's a different ball, a different place, different situation, you know, we're not... Not in the, the law is an example, and we know that. So, yeah, you know, having compassion for and loving your neighbor, it can be, and it frequently is, a balancing act, difficult to do. Take a look at Exodus 22 and 2. Check that. Check that. You know what this is? This is a case of a man who has to kill his neighbor who's in the process of defending his home. This guy has a robber. A robber's breaking in. And, he, and in order to defend his home, he's got to kill him. And God says, if that happens, there's no consequence. And there it is in the law. See, the thief, though, is the guy's neighbor, too. Here's the thief, this robber breaking in. He's his neighbor. You know? and, our, and we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. So what gives rise to this instruction? This is the balancing act I'm talking about. See, because this man has other neighbors in the house. You know who they are. The wife and kids. He's got to do his level best to d defend his wife and kids. Even if it means taking the life of his other neighbor, the thief. I'm so sorry. He's not happy about it. But, you know, just like, the, you know, the Father God, he's not happy about it either. You know, he says so. Ezekiel thirty three eleven. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure. I don't like it. I'm not happy about that. Neither is the guy that has to defend his family. See? 
like father, like son. You know, but God has to send people to hell. And sometimes the son has to take a life. That does happen. Oh. Oh. And things aren't easy for Jesus. They weren't easy for Jesus when he was here. They're not easy for us either. They're not easy. Yeah. But we're not under the law. We're not under the law. And so we have, and you know, we, we have the added complication of having to throttle then this guy, you know, while we're, while we're, you know, the wicked, it's trying to throttle the wicked impulses of the old man of sin, see. But the law of God is our guide. It's our example. You know, it's, it's not our enemy. It's not our justifier. God justifies. The law doesn't. So the Father wants us to handle cases like this, this way. Cases like that, that way. And he just gives us generalities. And we have to apply them as best we can, listen to the Holy Spirit, do what we can. But we're not going to be justified that way. You know, we don't, we don't even need to think it. We don't need to think about it even. So, and the Father knows it's tricky. Uh, just do your best. Do your best. See, for the natural man, <clears throat> there's no justification in the law. You know, in the end, the, the law is going to judge him. He's going to die. He's, that's what Christ said. In the end, my word, you're going to be judged by my words, and you're, you're, going, to be, you're going to fail. For the new man, though, justification comes by his faith, and by his adoption into the family. And so, and the law, then, is just a framework for the will of the Father in this world. This is the way, you know, we're supposed to interact with the world. You know, for the new man, the corners of the wheat field is not just your wheat field. The corners of the wheat field for the new man is the whole earth. And the poor people are people like his neighbors and like those neighbors and those neighbors who don't know Christ. They are poor. So, the poor and needy is everyone who's not a son of God. So, we're truly a different nation. We are a different nation. We do live in a different world. And so, now, it's, it's, you know, it's time for the invitation. And um, in a way, though, See, I'm not the only one who gives an invitation. Each of you give invitations too. But be careful when you invite your neighbors to Christ that, you, that they're not invited on the basis of a law, but they're invited on the basis of the adoption. You can be adopted. You don't have to die. You come to Christ. I can get you into a family where you will live forever. So, okay. And then you